Um, so hi everyone, can you hear me there? Mic test, good. Yeah, so we are going to give uh, some of our colleagues some few minutes so that they can join. So maybe we start at um, one or five, okay? Mike, check. Wilfred, can you hear me? Mike, check. Good afternoon. Hello, Grant, say something. Can you hear me? Yeah, my test again. Okay, I think we can start. Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, data use uh, session, uh, discussing a little bit or sharing experience and practice from the field um, on the use of data um, in routine information. So this session, we are going to be a um, couple of presenters. I and Elaine will be chairing this particular session, but uh, we have um, field experience from um, uh, Togo uh, Coffee will be kind of uh, presenting. We also have a story from Tanzania. Clement Kinga will be presenting. Arthur also Haywood will be presenting his story from Chinzali, Zambia. And of course, uh, Eric uh, Munyambazi, will be also presenting his story from uh, the use of data use uh, packages. One of the key thing about this particular um, uh, session is that last year, um, DHS2 annual conference, the theme of the uh, DHS2 annual conference was data use. And it was more or less focusing on how to turn DHS2 information into action. Now this particular year, we are actually kind of taking a stock and see what has happened within a year um, and, and if we have learned any experiences 
uh, from, from pushing uh, DHS2 into actionable decisions. Uh, my colleague Elaine, maybe a mic to you to speak a yeah. little bit before. No. Um, Yes. Wilfred, no, you've said it, said it very eloquently there. Um, as you said, last year we looked at the kind of absence of data use stories that have been documented. Um, so this year we're really interested in, in hearing from the experience over the year around data use. Um, so I won't say much, um, so we can hand it over to the first um, presenter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, let me uh, quickly uh, tell you some two stories from uh, the experience we had in Togo regarding data use. Uh, the first one is about district and the second one about region uh, uh, monitoring. Um, this is a photo that we took some, uh, some months ago. Some of you may have recognized the guy uh, back in the, in the photo. Can anyone guess? Karin? Prosper? Yeah, who said that? <laughs> yeah, it was Adam actually. Uh, we went to the field and to observe uh, a district uh, monitoring, monthly monitoring uh, uh, meeting. And I'm not on the, on the photo because I was the one taking the photos. So uh, it was very interesting. Uh, they were all together, over 20 health facility managers all around the district, uh, the district management officers uh, looking at data. And data uh, was exam uh, been examined in two ways. The first one is data quality. How qualitative was the data? So they will run this uh, WHO-based data uh, review into the DHIS2, and they will identify missing data, inconsistent data, and they will discuss with the health facility managers to understand the challenges and address them. And secondly, they are looking at performance, how performant district, uh, the district is and which ones of the health facilities are dragging the district back or which one are pushing the district forward. So they will use th these kind of data to uh, of table to, it is actually in the DHIS2, what you see is the Alma card. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Alma card. Alma is the African Leaders Alliance Against Malaria. So they, 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 they put malaria in a high level engagement from a presidency level and prime minister level. So they set a series of indicators they have to be monitoring every quarter and they have to report on it to be accountable on it. So we took that uh, Alma card and we uh, actually customized this into the DHS2, building it directly into DHS2 as the um, facilities are reporting the, uh, their, their performance, it is being built directly into the DHS2 so that the district can look at its performance, the region and the whole country. So uh, this card was, was very interesting because they were discussing it. And one thing that we appreciated there was the data availability. Data was available to inform this card because uh, it was something very critical at the highest level. And uh, one of those uh, health facility managers Tell, uh, actually uh, told us a story. He said uh, three years back, he was appointed as a facility manager. It was in 2017. He went there and there was no data. He had to reconstitute all the data 
from the ledgers or the registries that he can found there. But three years after, in 2020, he got appointed to another health facility. Then, because we rolled out DHIS2 in 2018, he was able to find the data all the way down. And that helped him a lot in doing what? In doing two things. First of all, doing the review of the performance of the facility for that year. And second one, build the facilities micro plan for the next year. So data was available. The second thing that we noticed was the denominator challenge. We noticed that some facilities were above 100% where such facilities were constantly below 50%. And the explanation was that uh, some populations are very moving. And some of those facilities were actually uh, at the border between Togo and Ghana. So uh, people will be coming from Ghana to, uh, to attend the facility and that can sometimes skyrock the performance. But we, Discussing with them, we have identified that it is very easy to have the denominators at the high level, at the country district level, but it's more uh, delicate to have it at the facility level. That's why denominator distribution has become a subject of concern for us, and we are doing uh, research on it. The third thing is that almost no analysis were done at the facility level. They were just populating the data in DHIS2 and then waiting by the end of the, the year to discover how performant they have been. But at the district level, the analysis um, capacities were limited. Most of the time, it is the HMIS team that was in charge for analysis of the data. The program uh, officers were not so familiar with it. So what we decided is to provide them with a simple guide for data analysis at the district level and then at the facility level. That was the experience from the district level. Here is the second story from the region level. What you see in red is one of the six health districts in Togo. It is called the Plateau region. This region, as you can see on the map, is the largest. And it also uh, include the largest number of facilities uh, of district 12 facility, 12 district up to actually. So when uh, a friend of mine, uh, a medical doctor, a colleague of mine was appointed last year as health region manager, he wanted to have an overview of the performance of his region. And he discovered that the region was actually a bad performer in uh, health programs. So he wanted to have a clear overview of the programs and of the districts. So he asked his uh, region managers to provide him with data. That was the nice Excel sheet he was provided with. And the fun, funny thing is that it was pulled, the data was pulled out of DHIS2 and then uh, pushed into Excel to show him the, 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 actually the, the situation. He was so disappointed that he sent that to us, saying that you guys have been working on DHS2 over years, but that's what I'm going, getting. So what can we do? So we, we convened with him uh, a meeting where we provide him with what we can actually be able to design a DHS2 as a dashboard. He was so amazed that he said, I want to have this now. So actually, at the moment we're speaking, they are in a workshop uh, to actually configure those dashboards for him so that he can be able to be seeing the performance, not only of his programs, but also for the district, because we told him that we can be, as he can be seeing the health district. I was telling that they have 12 health districts with a color code that enable him to see which one is in green and which one is in red. So oh, what uh, are we planning to do moving forward? The first thing is that uh, we have six regions in the country 
the plan is that if uh, once the, the experience is successful in one region, we can scale it up by the other regions. Second thing is that we have started discussion with the minister, the minister his, himself, so that he can have this data the, uh, dashboard directly in his office, so that he can be able to be discussing the, with the, the regions. The improvement we, we plan regarding the, the system itself, it's about SMS alert. Uh, someone was uh, talking about it in the, the, the previous sessions. The, the, actually, he has to go to the DHS to, to see what is going on. But if we can uh, configure SMS that can alert him once uh, a district is below or above a threshold, then he can go now to the DHS do more frequently. And we have targeted, we have triggered a positive deviant research, which is about what? When we will be looking at those districts and those regions, we will be uh, identifying those that are well performing and learning from their performance, we can replicate them to the other district without putting not so much money. So those are the stories from Togo, and I thank you for your attention. Um, thanks, Kofi, for this uh, wonderful experience. Uh, I like the way you kind of uh, ended up with talking about, you know, getting information out of DHS too, you know, customize uh, message for these decision makers, managers, so that they can make some action out of that. Uh, our second presenter is uh, Clement Kihinga from uh, His Tanzania. Um, he will join us online. Um, is he there? Clement, can you hear us? Yes. Technology. Clement Kinga, if you, yes, if you can unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you, thank you. You can take it over. I will be changing the slides for you here. Please, please. please. Hello, my name is Kinga Clement, and I'm presenting the uh, the development and the use of national alarm on SH and H scorecard in Tanzania. Next slide. And uh, this uh, photo is a launch the date when we launched the day when we launched the scorecard. It was launched. Next slide. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes, I can see. It is the historical background of the of the of the squad card is that uh, between 2009 and 2015, we have the national roadmap strategic plan to improve reproductive and maternal newborn and child, child health and adolescent health, which called for periodic tracking of performance of interventions. But at that time we did in, we did not we only have DHS2 data, which one helped to analyze and uh, and uh, develop uh, Excel uh, templates, and uh, the knowledge of uh, using that technology was not very universal. So the ministry and the the section needed uh, some sort of a tool for 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 tracking and uh, for accountability. And that's why we allowed it a, a decision to adopt to develop the reproductive maternal on newborn and child and adults health square card based on the Arma Maria square card. Next. So I will, I will give you a, a short background of the our of our square card. Toward the end of the implementation of our national of our national of our national strategy for maternal health, 
child health, adolescent health development, we we co we developed a, a short term plan, which we called a sharpened a sharpened plan for for the years 2014 to 2015. And we, we decided that it was decided that means that it was now the time also to include the the development of the Aramon SHA scorecard. So we started a work on that and the good part of it, the new health sector strategy also called for the scorecard to be included in the in the in our plan to be used in nationally, regionally, and also the local councils, local governments and when the councils. So it was a, there was a, a high policy decision that gave us a, the, 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 the big push to develop that uh, scorecard. Next. <clears throat> so in 2014, that's with the support from ARBA, WHO, and the University of Salaam and the other partners, we developed the first scorecard. And uh, we use the normal color codes of green for target achieved on track, yellow for prog on the prog progress, but not efforts, some more efforts more required. And the red not on track, and the gray for data not available. And it was launched by the then president of uh, Tanzania, His Excellency Yakaya Murisho Kikwet on the 15th of May 2014. Next. So this is scorecard was launched together with the Sharpened One plan, so that it, during the first two years, the doc, the, that document, the scorecard should go hand in hand. And uh, it includes my indicators for tracking key maternal and child health indicators to identify bottlenecks and to drive action for national and regional and the low government decisions. So in collaboration with Arma, University of Dasrama and the other as a partners, the MOH has been continuing strengthening this scorecard as a management and accountability tool. And now 2022 from 2015 is uh, seven years of operations. Next. Let me now share with you the implementation, uh, the implementation uh, levels and updates. The, our scorecard is implemented at the national, regional, and district level. And I was ahead from my previous present that it goes to the, to the facilities. For us, at the facilities, because of the problem of the denominator, like what has been said about Togo, we said that uh, our calculations were started district, regional, and national. For the health facilities, they just collect the aggregated data. The scorecard does address priority indicators with reliable, reliable data that was agreed by stakeholders and development part. And the first scorecard was for January to March 2014. And the information comes from the, most of the information comes from HIMS DHS2, but there are three indicators come from other systems. The one indicator on uh, national health insurance and another indicator on uh, vaccination. They come from other systems, but most of the data comes from DHS to HIMS. And all the cancers, we have currently we have 184 of them. They are responsible for data collection, data quality auditing, and the electronic capture of the data. Hmm. Next. We have, I will share with you the key success factors. One is the use of, use of the scorecard as a management tool at your levels. And the one I said at your levels, it means from, uh, from uh, district, regions, and the central level, and the, to some extent at the facility level. Number two, the decentralization of the scorecard and the use at the lower level from the national we, to include the regions and the local governments. Third, the integration into existing management processes and the use at the political level, high level. And the fourth, wide dissemination and public sharing. And the, another success factor is the evaluation and documentation of best practice. Let us start with the first. Next. 
So on a use as a management to at all levels, it is used by the government in the both national, regional, district level, law government. Number one, it does facilitate updating. <clears throat> it first we facilitate updating the score card every quarter in a timely manner. Usually 30 days after that has been entered into the system, that is when we can export the data to into the score card. Number two, all the indicators, indicators that are extracted from the HMS DGSU are fully populated. There are two components. The first component is the service data, which comes through from, from HMS DGS2. And the second component is the denominator, which comes from the Bureau of Standards, Bureau of Statistics, the population data. Indicators are reviewed based on the latest strategic plans. Like now, we have uh, new strategic plans. Also, the, 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 the square cards were designed in, in 2015, but now we have two, we have two different, we have a, a new strategic plan, but the square card is still responding. And the wide range of stakeholders and at both levels are using the square card. It is, and there's the, some, therefore, login authorities to view the square card. Other functions of the square card are also used in the action tracker. Our square card is an action tracker that can be documented and used for decision making. Next. The second one is the decentralization of the square card and the use at region on the ROGA levels. The square card is being used at the region on the ROGA levels by the government and local partners. In the initial slide, in the previous slide, it is the user at the high level. Now this is the user at the local level. When NGO is working in the, in the region or the district, they use the specific square card for that district. Second is they use, the regions use the square card to support the, to prioritize resources, to program planning, and also to discuss the mutual accountability of the accountability within the LOGAs. And the both partners from all, all levels they use the square card to monitor progress and support implementations. And the regions, the ROJ, have improved the safety delivery based on the square card. In fact, they're using it for, if they that from the square card, they are being used for, 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 for budgeting, they are being used for expansion of services, and also to collect if there are any shortfalls. Next. <clears throat> Then the third one is the integration into existing management processes and the use at political level. You see, in the ministry, we have taken working groups. Also, the, the, and the, there are a number of uh, routine meetings and other things. So now the square card, using those meetings, the square card is reviewed, reviewed nationally, regionally, and the ROG level in, in the existing management meetings, including technical working groups. And the actions are captured in meetings and the ministry. And, and the in the action tracker and the implementation is also documented at all levels. And the square card is also used for supervision and performance management. In fact, the indicators that are in the square card, some were extracted from the uh, consolidated from the integrated management tools. The square card is also used for planning, budgeting. Our budgeting cycle runs from July to June. So the, they use this data to form the square card. They use it for, for budgeting. Next slide. Uh, Kihinga, you have one minute yes. remaining. OK, thank you. Let us uh, skip this one. Let us go to the conclusion. The next. Yes, this is the enable as why did we succeed? Number one, the involvement of the president himself, of the presidents, who have made the square card one of the agenda during their visit to the region district. And number two, the high profile of the ranch of the square card. All the high officials were there. They started with the high awareness in the country about the need to improve the health of the mothers and children. Next. The other factors is the simple color code. 
The next thing, we, the next thing factor that the, the, for our success is the discussion of the scorecard at all levels, district and the regions, and also the regular variability of HMS DHS2 data at all levels. And also the country technical skills from the MOH, University of Dasramo and the other partners. Next. So based on the based on the successes of our scorecard, there have been a number of other uh, implementers also coming with the scorecard because uh, the success of the Aram says scorecard, you see influenced and they want, also want to emulate on uh, their success. For example, we have the PMTC scorecard now, we have the nutrition scorecard, we have the basket funding scorecard, we have the environmental health scorecard. But the RM CH was the first. So these are our products of data based on that success. Next slide, please. I thank you for your attention. And that's all for uh, the story of our uh, uh, square card in Tanzania. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kihinga, for that interesting presentation, linking up the uh, scorecard with the uh, political awareness on the country. Now it's up to Arthur with Shinzali's story. You need to unmute. Okay, while, while Arthur is, is um, setting up there, there's a question coming in on Hello? the chat. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Can you hear? Yeah. There's a question on the chat from Yvonne that Clement or Joseph, if you could respond within the chat, if we don't get time to it at the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, where are we? Yeah. Okay. We're going to switch countries and go to Chinsali in Zambia. If you can see, which side is it? Chinsali is a really remote district in northern Zambia, 12 hours away from the capital. And it's really in the middle of nowhere. It's been implementing DHIS since 2006, DHS2 for the, since 2014. And like every other rural district in Zambia, it enters data at district level. There was a Gavi project that focused on data entry at facility level that started exactly the time that COVID came in. I mean, I was in there drawing up the implementation plan when COVID struck. And fortunately, Gavi said, all right, carry on, let's do it anyway. I came back a year later after the project had been implemented and I used I spent a month there doing participatory research, talking to all the people involved, about 50 people in all in the district, went out and visited the six um, high turnover districts and using a data collection tool that was standardized. I mean, in reality, what happened was the first six months of the project was spent converting ordinary face-to-face -face learning materials into distance learning. And we worked very closely with HISP South Africa to implement distance learning, but it took six months. So the actual project itself was six, six months total, of which the first six weeks was teaching people how to enter the data. And it was, you know, entering data is not very difficult. If you can use a WhatsApp message, you know how to enter data into DHS2. That was not the big deal. What was interesting was that people then started to own their data. They tried to, in an attempt to understand their data, and they attempted to use the data. And I think. That quote on the right hand side says it all. We used to just send the data to the district. Now it's ours and we own it and we try to make it better. Yeah? 
the other major thing that happened was, I mean, the district information officer was really insulted when I said, you're just a glorified data entry clerk. But I'm not a data entry clerk. After the facility started to enter the data, she suddenly realized that all she had been doing for the last five years was entering data. And she was suddenly liberated to actually do some work in data quality control and data use. And I think that was one of the most important things about this project was entering data into the facility liberates the district information officer to do other more useful things. The other thing that happened was that the district health management team suddenly had a focus for their activities. They were suddenly the immunization officer was looking at his EPI data. The mother and child health program officer suddenly could see that people were coming to immunization, I mean, for antenatal care. All of them were coming into town and there was no antenatal care being done in the periphery. And she started to realize the functioning of the program based on data. The other thing that was really surprising was, and I had quite good entry into the Ministry of Health, the m and &E office, I mean, m and &E director was an old friend of mine. And they suddenly realized, whoa, there's a whole lot more that we can do. And they started looking at data use guidelines. They started saying, oh, we, that's what we need to do. And they put a lot of effort into developing data guidelines. We managed to convince them that data use should be introduced into the pre-service facility. They, they, they had <clears throat> been developing pre-service guidelines, but they didn't contain data use. And we started talking to them about what we've been doing in Chinsali. Oh, yeah, we put that into the curriculum. Good idea, Arthur. <laughs> it, was, it was really, really fascinating. They also started looking at monitoring evaluation frameworks. Yeah, and then the normal Ministry of Health, blah, blah, about feedback mechanisms and community health information systems that nothing has ever happened with. But, but there was discussions about data at every, every level. But there were major problems. Huh? It wasn't all rosy. And we used, I don't know whether anybody knows the PRISM framework, but we used the PRISM framework to look at the organizational, technical, and human factors. And by far the biggest challenge was the organizational side of things. This, people had the data in front of them, but they didn't have any idea what to do with it. There's no point having data if you're not told what you're expected to do with it. So that each facility was doing completely different things with their data, and there was no standardization, no ability to compare districts or facilities. That's where we should we'll use in future the scorecard. That's, that's a really nice concept. The other thing is demand for data. Unless there's an institutional demand for data, Nobody is going to use it. If it's not in your job description, if it's not part of your monthly activities, then people are not going to use data. And that has to come from all levels, but especially from the higher level for planning, monitoring, and supervision. The third big organizational problem was that the data all traditionally just went upwards and nothing came back again. And people get very discouraged when they don't get feedback. And there's actually no system in Zambia to send. Nobody uses DHS2 feedback features to provide feedback to the facility level collectors. The population 
has been mentioned everywhere, and we're going to talk about it later this afternoon, but that's another major issue. Technical DHS2. I know those of you who've worked with Zambia DHS2, and I see Nora shaking her head. It's a it's a mess, but it's it's kind of muddles along and is functional. Hmm? It needs major revision, but people are used to it and then they know how to do. The real problem is that the parallel systems don't feed into DHS2. So we have no logistics data. There's an EPI program. We were supposed to implement the EPI app, but we didn't, only 40 of the 100 data elements, no, sorry, not 40 of 100, 40% of the data elements required for the EPI app are actually available. So 60%, no vaccine availability data, no cold chain data, no human resource data. So the EPI app is, I don't know whether any, anybody is able to use that app, but certainly I haven't ever seen it properly used. And that was supposed to be core to it. Human <clears throat> side, yeah, I mean, there's an amazing amount of skill at health facility level to use computers. I mean, most of the people at facility level actually had their own computer. Many of them were using their own computers for, of, for health facility work, but that had never been tapped into and it is still not tapped into. And there's a huge potential um, at facility level for computer skills. And the people at facility level, they're also, they're not, exposed they had never been there'd never been a single training anywhere in chinsali people at facility level on information systems there's, they're just not not exposed and as a result there's very little discussion data use work practices had actually changed that was what i went to go and look at data use work practices had changed considerably with the entry of data, 100% timing, timeliness and completeness of reporting. And I think to me, the biggest, this is my lesson, not for, is that distance learning really works at facility level. Even a rushed, hastily cobbled together, unprofessional distance learning which is what we had, worked incredibly well to get people motivated. And the key to the distance learning working was to train local district health management team members to be the trainers. So we had four DHMT members who then became trainers, and they then became the biggest advocates of DHAS. And with the district working towards data use, then the entire, or the district team working towards data use, the entire district started um, working. The data review meetings that Kofi was talking about, they held them and they were absolute waste of time before, but now the health workers, because we gave the data review meeting some structure. They looked forward to this thing, and it wasn't about finding faults with districts. It was really focusing on performance because all the data quality stuff had been done before, and you focused on performance at the data review meetings rather than problems. Yeah. Um, so again, we won't talk about populations. We. <clears throat> They, we'll talk about that later. But there was a there was a field of blooming flowers in terms of data use. Unfortunately, the project stopped. Money was withdrawn. Technical support didn't come, and the whole thing collapsed. The people are still there with their skills, 
they're still going to their data review meetings, they're still entering their data 100% completeness and timeliness, but the whole motivation, the whole drive has kind of gone away. The ministry doesn't have the money to follow it up. The ministry was really excited by it, but they're unable to follow it through and it's stuck. A little bit of water. Oh, what have I done? Okay, you can see it anyway. Um, a little bit of water and those flowers would come back to life. It's not going to happen overnight. It will happen when we, how much, how much time we've got? Zero. Okay, that's fine. That's all I need. Um, we need guidelines on data use. We need ongoing distance education we need for example half of the staff has moved so we need to train the new people coming in that process is now stopped the district health management team is all excited but they don't have any power to change things and there's no ability to bring in new processes and new systems and there's very little that we can do about setting using data in planning monitoring and evaluation but the potential is there we've planted the seed it just needs to be watered thank you very much thank you arthur um time is a little bit short so we'll just go ahead and jump to our next presenter eric can you hear us there? Joining us from- Hi, Hi Wilfred, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, take it away. Thank you. Can you allow me to share my screen, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, Wilfred, can I share the, my, my, my slide? I don't know whether this is the, the one that is uh, shared online. Okay. Um, I think you should be able to share your screen. Oh, okay. Just refresh and then, uh, yeah, I think it should be the same. Please share. Oh, so we share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Hello, Wilfred. Yes, we can we can see your screen. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, taking time to listen in and also share. Uh, in these uh, data use experiences and practices. My name is Eric Miyambabazi, and I will share with you uh, some of the experiences we have seen in Uganda and also in, um, in other countries that we have worked with and also supported. Um, the uh, concept of data use really uh, would make a lot of sense uh, starting to look at the data sources because wherever we have been um, in most countries, uh, the sources are partly to uh, partly contribute to how we uh, ultimately use the data uh, in country. So um, health data largely is captured at health facility or within the community and depending on the point of contact. Today, we are talking about non-health areas. And so we may have to thinking about um, uh, how to work with the sources where this data comes from. Um, the tools that we use uh, are largely standardized um, and aggregate at different levels. Uh, and also to note that uh, data national level are also accessed through both electronic and manual system. So uh, for data use packages, 
whenever we have to support them, it's important to take note of some of these levels uh, of access and uh, where the data is, is ultimately coming from. And of course, at the national level, DHIS2 uh, has played a very key role um, in providing electronic records uh, for use. Um, I thought I would also speak a little bit on uh, other sources of data uh, because, again, these contribute a lot on how we, uh, we use the data. Uh, in country where I come from, we have data from administrative levels, um, from inventory, uh, supervision management meetings, uh, where, for example, we, in, our, in Uganda, they are able to track the, the number of times um, uh, national level teams are able to do support supervision at lower levels. Um, yeah, so it's, it's important to take note of some of these and also the population based health surveys that deal with um, uh, district health surveys and national health surveys. Uh, we have data from such institutions and academic data. Um, uh, uh, as well, and then uh, health information research that do clinical trials and longitudinal community studies. So in the health domain, the, the, the sources are really quite broad and pulling all these sources together to make sense uh, is really quite key and important. Uh, we are having currently a discussion on how to pull data on civil registrations and vital statistics uh, to be able to contribute to some of the program data that we are looking at uh, at the national level. Um, so sorry to interrupt quickly, you there, Eric. There's a lot of background yeah. noise, so I would just ask people to make sure that they're muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nora. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, also we have data on uh, sentinel events uh, as well as civil registration and vital statistics. Um, so in terms of packages, really, that we have been dealing with a lot, um, largely, uh, it's data on uh, on uh, uh, data first of all generated through uh, the uh, DHIS2 as a as a main repository, and then also data on uh, on uh, using uh, generic applications uh, like scorecard, bottleneck analysis, and also the the data quality apps. Um, um, yeah, so we, we've looked at uh, uh, largely and by and large uh, the, uh, the analysis and visualization features from DHIS2 and these are for all teams that are using DHIS2 and of course the additional uh, applications like scorecard bottleneck analysis, uh, the data quality applications, uh, one that used to be called the WHO data quality applications. And so these play a very key role in terms of how to use uh, the data that is being generated. And so how the applications are presented uh, becomes very, very important. In some of the uh, screenshots you see, for example, these are screenshots that were taken from one of the facility offices where they are able to generate these uh, visualizations and then pin them on the on the on the on the dashboard on the notes board but of course this does not really quite often demonstrate the use of, of data pinning the, the the charts doesn't really help that so we started pushing uh, to see uh, more and more of how this data can be used beyond looking at a dashboard beyond looking at a notes board beyond looking at a, a scorecard uh, showing uh, performance uh, trends uh, using some of these uh, tools. So um, in terms of uh, experiences uh, on how this has been used, uh, by and large, uh, DHIS2 plays a very key and significant role in the uh, provision of data. And uh, for our case, it's a compilation of the annual health sector performance report, which is really a key report that um, is important for the country, but also 
uh, uh, data that comp uh, is comprised in that report is generated from some of these features. Um, secondly, the, uh, we have been working with a program that deals with uh, sexual and reproductive health as well as uh, gender-based violence that generates data using scorecards. Uh, important to note that uh, data generated from uh, DHIS to using these scorecards has facilitated uh, uh, prioritization of indicators, uh, generating targets, and also uh, priority data sets for, for analysis. Uh, this uh, particular uh, area, we, we worked with a couple of uh, members of the Ministry of Health and uh, districts to generate something called a, an indicator handbook. Um, and that handbook summarizes uh, key indicators that are used um, in, in, in monitoring the, the, the project and the interventions. Then uh, linkages and integration of key areas uh, these uh, we, we have gone ahead to link, uh, for example, um, HR data generated from the IRIS with the DHIS2 to be able to address issues of denominators. I had, I think, Henry talk about this earlier on. Um, we've also, uh, the packages have fostered awareness and spa planning. Uh, we have the bottleneck analysis currently in around 30 five districts uh, that are using it to, to do research, to do um, uh, district planning. And the data that is really uh, generated from the bottleneck analysis, uh, which we worked on recently, uh, facilitated the planning uh, for this cycle of the year uh, using the bottleneck analysis. We have seen also this in, uh, in other countries, uh, in Tanzania, I think also, um, in, in Rwanda, they are trying to use the bottleneck and the scorecard to do the same. There is a video on, on this that we have posted uh, in the chat. Uh, the participants here can watch it uh, in the free time. Then linkages within the community initiatives. Uh, we have a story of a district that um, where politicians uh, used data generated uh, in the DHIS2 uh, charts to uh, to create um, uh, a borehole, to identify places where they had quite a number of problems and then uh, create boreholes there. Um, further experiences uh, on data use as seen in those cities have spurred the uh, uh, facilities conducting uh, uh, weekly uh, CMEs, uh, what we call continuous uh, 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 education in facilities. And uh, these ones that uh, are done based on some of the analysis that is generated from the, from the apps and the systems. We have district, uh, um, a district uh, quarterly and monthly data review meetings in some of those screenshots uh, based on the charts. Um, I need to also mention that uh, the uh, data use in, in a big way is contributing to innovations. For example, we did uh, generate uh, work with the community to uh, develop the smart display app, which uh, was to further uh, uh, show and simplify the way this data is analyzed and visualized. Um, in different places currently in the ministry, on the ministries to monitor screens. Uh, we have deployed that in the city hall, in the, um, in the main CBD and so on. Then also to mention that routine audits have been um, conducted based on the data that is generated from these uh, uh, charts. Uh, routine orientations on data reviews, I mentioned that. And then basic infrastructure, um, uh, support on internet and devices, uh, which is really by and large uh, generated based on the reporting rate completeness, for example, within the HIS2, that helps us to understand which facilities are not uh, reporting and why are they not reporting um, and so on. So the, these country experiences have uh, quite uh, uh, been enhanced by the use of, of, uh, of data in DHIS2 and the application packages that, uh, that fall within there. There are a couple of uh, uh, focus areas which we think uh, are very key for data use in most of the countries that we have worked with. 
and this is investment in analysis and, and interpretation. Uh, this is very, very key. If people don't understand data, uh, there is no way they can use it. Um, and we are also uh, understanding with time that just generally having dashboards, pinning them on walls uh, doesn't really help much. Then uh, additionally, uh, we are seeing data engaging and engaging uh, middle level managers, one for them to uh, generate demand so that data is generated based on demand. Um, and then two, uh, training and capacity building for these uh, middle level managers. And then uh, the other key component is dissemination of uh, data use products. Um, earlier on, I mentioned about the indicator handbook, uh, which is a very short, uh, brief and summarized uh, manual for indicators. Um, here, we also talk about bulletins. These could be uh, uh, either monthly or quarterly or even weekly uh, bulletins showing performance so that action is able to be taken. Um, we talked about league tables uh, that need to be also uh, uh, generated and distributed. Then the last part is the tracking of actions. And this is a bit new. We have not really used this, uh, this application, uh, this called Action Tracker. Uh, that we need to have a bit more inc increased investment and rollout of applications such as scorecards, BNA, and action trackers, so that uh, people are able to monitor uh, the uh, investment on some of these um, data use packages and applications. Then um, some of the drawbacks we have uh, observed, one, of course, uh, 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 large data sets is, is one of the key, for example, for the case of Uganda, um, then uh, operational level not involved in the design, um, work overload uh, for facilities. We have clinicians turning into uh, data collection facts and, and that becomes a bit of a challenge. Incomplete and inconsistent data, then missing key data points. I mentioned earlier a point on linkaging, on linking um, with different, uh, uh, with different uh, sectors. And then uh, parallelism where we have, you know, different programs running in different uh, uh, systems, as well as uh, to start turnover. I think I made a timer and uh, I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Over to you, Fred. We started five past, so we just have one minute remaining uh, to end our session. Um, we have heard a lot of themes here, institutional data use from Arthur. We have heard a lot about, you know, this scorecard to promote uh, data use at the national level, subnational level, and et cetera. But I've not really heard a lot about this data use at the facility level. And I think that's where the data source is coming from. Maybe I could pick a brain of Nora because somebody mentioned Nora, if you can speak something about that. <laughs> Anything, but for one minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> Eric pointed out that one of the big problems is the large data sets and um, I think that if we can start to tackle those and try and get them reduced, I think we may sort of start to have a way forward. Because if you talk about data use at facility and you've got data sets that look like this, where on earth do you start? What do you define as important? What do you define as what you must concentrate on? And what do you define as you must have good data quality on? So we seriously need to reduce our data sets. And we have historical reasons of why we collect these massive lists of morbidity and mortality in age and gender groups and, and things like that. And we need to start tackling those. And I'm quite sure that if we reduce that, we have something that the facility people can look at, can understand and move forward.
Thank you. Um, our time is up. If you have any comments, questions on data use, we are on the COP. Uh, there's a data use uh, channel there. You can post there some questions and comments and uh, we can continue discussion there. Thank you very much for your attendance and uh, let's clap for each other. Thank you.